There is a reason that this episode is about a week early, but you'll have to listen to the end to find out why. I have read a number of articles or works of self-professed world historians, but I've never read a good one. Seriously, I've never seen a good piece of work describing itself as world history. If you know of one, feel free to leave the reference in the comments and I will take a look. Why is that? Well, I think the answer is fairly obvious. World history is just a modern way of saying that you plan to tackle a very big question, something that encompasses a long period or covers a very wide geographic area. As questions get bigger, in the sense of encompassing more sources, then obviously they get harder. And this, I think, is a fundamental issue. There are just some questions that are too big to answer. Let me give an example, a question I've mulled over at various points, but never felt I was able to tackle in order to illustrate this. First, I need to dump a little bit of background information. Coins were invented a little over two and a half thousand years ago, and when they were first invented, there were essentially just two places making coins, a mint in Lydia, that's in modern Turkey, and some mints in China. The vast majority of people would never have seen a coin. The vast majority of people lived in states that never issued a coin. Fast forward 1500 years, and the situation across most of Europe and Asia could not have been more different. Almost every political unit of any substantial size issued coins, and while some people did not routinely use them, there would have been very few people who had never seen one. Coins had, by the early 2nd millennium AD, become as ubiquitous a part of material culture as pottery. That is just an observation. It only really turns into a question when we juxtapose it with another observation about trade. The movement of objects over long distances is almost as old as our records allow us to see. But there is no question that deliberate trade in objects between people who did not live in the same political unit, or even in polities that bordered each other, spice from the South Indian kingdoms to Egypt, silk from China to Rome, silver plate from Europe to the Persian empires, that kind of trade has intensified enormously in the last 3,000 years. And I don't think there can be any serious question that the period from the mid-first millennium BC through to the early second millennium AD, the period during which, as I observed, coinage was invented and spread across Eurasia, that that period saw marked and significant increase in long-distance trade. Again, those are just observations. It's the juxtaposition that creates a question across roughly the same period, both long-distance trade and a particular physical representation of money, coins, become much more common. Is there any connection between those two things? Did one facilitate the other? Are they the result of a common cause? Do they really align? Or is it actually a superficial resemblance? That is a world history kind of question. And my problem with it is that it feels too big. It's not a complicated question. You can see how to go about answering it. That's quite obvious. You just quantify how many coins there are and how much trade there is at any particular moment. And you do that for each place and each moment, from the 7th century BC to the 11th century AD, from Ireland to Japan. And then you look at the evidence for how people travelled and traded and how people used coins, and you look to see if there are patterns connecting them. Does one follow the other or vice versa? Do they synchronise or diverge? Did traders use coins? When? And how? The procedure is obvious. It's the type of question mathematicians refer to as trivial because there is no methodological difficulty in working out where to start, but the scale is daunting. Just think about the decades of work it would take to sift through archaeological reports to track all of the objects that have moved and to build indexes to give a sense of how they relate to each other. And none of that data is easy to work with. It is all embedded within the peculiar limitations of its narrow fields, which need to be fully understood if they are to be navigated. Let me use a famous example to illustrate why I think this is such a problem. This is a histogram produced by A.J. Parker. I'm taking it from an article he wrote in 1984, which I think is the first time he published it. A few years later, in 1992, he would publish a catalogue of shipwrecks, including 1,189 from the Mediterranean. 
which is used as the data that underpins a huge number of histograms like this. Interest in the study of wrecks has really taken off in the last 40 or 50 years. And today, the Oxford Roman Economy Project has a database, uh, really more of a spreadsheet, recording 1,784 known examples. And this graph has been incredibly influential. As one author put it, Parker's most famous histogram has since been reproduced in so many contexts that it now essentially serves as shorthand for the increase and decrease in maritime activity over the Greco Roman period, and more generally, the long term growth and decline of the ancient economy. In other words, this histogram shows us how trade increased and then diminished rapidly during the period of the Roman Empire. Except it doesn't. This histogram doesn't show us anything about what happened in the ancient world. Its shape is entirely an artefact of the data recording process. Note that I'm not saying that the conclusions drawn by Parker were wrong, just that they do not follow from this chart. Such are the nuances historical research is made of. Let me illustrate that by showing you one of the individual records in the Oxrep list. What was number 837 in Parker's list? Take a look at the date for the shipwreck. You see, in a lot of cases, shipwrecks are not particularly well explored, or the things they are carrying are not particularly distinctive. So all you can really say is that it's Roman. That is not a precise date, a range of 550 years in this case. Parker's solution was simply to take the middle date, 125 AD, which means all of these types of wreck, and by and large poorly dated wrecks outnumber well-dated ones, get lumped in the 1st or 2nd century. Once you realise that, it's entirely unsurprising that we end up with a peak in the middle of our main date ranges. And this is not a straightforward problem to solve. Some years later, Andrew Wilson pointed out the problem, that using the midpoint of a date range potentially was misleading, and showed how you could alter the apparent shape of the graph simply by changing the size of the bins on the histogram and assuming a wreck was equally likely to be lost at any point in the range of dates assigned to it. The correct takeaway from Wilson's article is that this data has a lot of systemic problems because it is not a random sample of ancient shipping and as a result it is very easy to create artefacts in an aggregate presentation which reflect how you are presenting, not anything that exists in the underlying data. Unfortunately, far too many scholars just jumped from naively treating Parker's graph as representing Mediterranean trade to naively treating Wilson's graph as representing Mediterranean trade. The problem is obvious. If there was a steady increase in the long distance transport of roof tiles from the 1st to the 5th century AD, but all of the roof tiles in that period look the same, then you cannot see that through this sort of data. In fact, you are likely, with both Parker and Wilson's method, to get an erroneous impression. And while the details of the problem are specific to Roman maritime archaeology, the problem itself is not unique. These charts, based respectively on museum collections and hoards, count the number of coins across the centuries in South Asia. And no, it's not the same problem here. Generally speaking, you can date when a coin was made much more easily than you can a roof tile. No, the problem here is one of scholarly attention. There has always been much more interest in North India than in Peninsular India, so museum collections and even lists of hoards reflect that. These aren't really charts about South Asia, they are charts about a particular bit of South Asia. And the numbers do not reflect how many coins were used, but rather which dynasties have attracted the greatest amount of academic interest. The more scholarly attention that has been given to a particular series of coins, the more likely hoards are to be reported and published, and the greater the effort museums will go to, to acquire examples. What offence did the coins in their apparent trough in the middle commit in order to be excluded? They were issued by dynasties modern scholars do not care about, and they are by and large, small, dull coins with repetitive designs. But that's a problem. Being small and dull and repetitive are the kinds of compromises you might expect somebody making coins to engage in as they increased rather than 
decreased mass production. Ultimately, the answer here is much the same as it was for the shipwrecks. No amount of staring at that chart will tell you how many coins were in use, just as no amount of staring at Parker or Wilson's charts will tell you anything about increases or decreases in Mediterranean trade. If you want answers to those questions, you will need to understand the data, not the charts. And what's the problem with that? Well, the question I raised at the beginning is a question about Eurasia. But these two examples cover just a tiny bit of that area. These examples need to be data points amongst hundreds of others in order to help us answer the big question of whether there is a relationship between long distance trade and coins. But they are not data points. They are questions in their own right, both of which have in practice already absorbed decades of work. And I think that is the fundamental problem the moment you try to ask a world history kind of question. The question is just too big. And any attempt to answer it would have to be some combination of speculative and or disconnected from reality by misunderstandings and misinterpretations. Like I said, I've read more than a few self-described world history pieces and they've all been universally awful in exactly this kind of way. But if you think there might be some gem hiding amongst the muck, feel free to nominate it in the comments. So at the start of this episode, I teased that there was a reason I was releasing it a week early. The answer, and it kind of connects to what made me think about getting my annoyance with world history off my chest, is that I was invited at fairly short notice to participate in a seminar on ancient trade. Not on big questions, but on small ones. Specifically, looking at finds of coins in the Indian Ocean. Now, I won't be talking about Western coins found in India. A bit like the charts I showed you earlier, I think they get a little bit too much attention. But rather, I will be offering a counterpoint. I will be talking about Indian coins found in Europe. Anyway, I've been told the seminar is open to anyone who is interested, and I put the flyer, which includes a Zoom link, on my Academia page, the link below in the description, and I realised if I gave it a shout out on my normal schedule, the episode would be airing after most of the event was over. So today, I'm a week early to give you a chance to attend if you want to. And now we can have the thank you for listening slide. <laughs>